All right, hello everybody. This is James Stanley with Daily Effects. Just wanted to do a quick sound check. So if you can hear my voice, please type in a Y. Please type in a Y if my voice is coming through. All right, perfect. And uh, once we get confirmation all the way, which it looks like we have, we'll get the session started. Beautiful. Good to see a lot of familiar faces in the room. Pete, Hans, Andrew, Greta, Sharif. Do we need a list? That's a good thing. Uh, I just want to say thank you very much for your time in advance uh, for attending this session. We're going to look at price action setups in a variety of different markets. I wanted to focus today on uh, the Canadian dollar and the British pound. Both have been on the move quite a bit of recent. I think that uh, relative themes in the U.S. dollar have somewhat quieted for a little bit. You can see right here where we're in a support zone right now. Um, so I figured while this was still at issue, we could take a look at some of these bigger picture themes taking place around the world uh, to look at where that next, what, what, what might be around that next corner. Uh, now before we get to that, I need to go through a couple of quick risk disclaimers. I'm going to leave each up for about 15 seconds. As usual, this session is all about you, so any questions that you have, please feel free to type those in. I'll do my absolute best to take care of those in the Q&A portion of the webinar, which I have planned for about 30 minutes from now. So uh, let's go through those risk disclaimers. We'll get right back onto the chart, type in your questions, and we'll rock and roll. Risk disclaimer part one, trading is risky. If you're not familiar with this, please do familiarize yourself with it. Like I said, I'm going to give this just about 15 seconds, and then we'll click on play, and uh, we'll move on here. All right, risk disclaimer part two, the hypothetical trading disclaimer. We're going to look at some past trades. We're going to look at some strategy. Anytime we do so, we have to know past performance is not indicative of future results. Same deal. I'm going to give this about another 10 seconds, and then we'll move right onto the chart. All right, let's make this happen. So, as mentioned, USD is still in that process of retracement. We peaked out just about three weeks ago now, well, exactly three weeks ago now. And since then, the dollar has slid a little bit. Um, we're talking about 3% or more. Notice we peaked out here at 3882. Right now, we're playing with the 100 level on DXY. And it seems though there's a lot of questions about whether or not the Trump trade is even real. I'm not going to speak to all that because it's neither here nor there, nor can we decide on that today. But what I will say is that structurally, from a trend standpoint, this is still alive. And until we get a significant break below the 50 fib in this most recent major move, I would want to move forward under that assumption that the Trump trade is still alive and well. Um, I think one of the big obfuscations from this is the fact that it is Trump. There's a lot of question marks around the guy. And you know, given some of the talk that we've heard around border tax, NAFTA, um, the strong dollar policy, quote unquote, that we've seen coming to the spotlight last week and then again on Mr. Mnuchin's uh, uh, nomination hearing yesterday, it, it, it seems as though there's some folks that are really starting to question whether or not we're going to get those three rate hikes this year and longer term, whether we are going to see a governmental backing of a strong dollar policy. Again, that's neither here nor there. Price action is indicating that this is still alive, given that we're still 50% or above the 50% retracement in that major move around the election. And until that breaks, I want to move forward under that assumption. Now, that said, just because we're at support, I don't want to put all my chips on red and just hope that it goes up. And that's what today's session is about, looking for areas where we might be able to diversify around this type of theme. So given this recent bout of weakness, let's look at one pair that's really shown that weakness quite prominently. And we're going to do that over here in the British Pound uh, cable. We had another driver come out this morning. One moment, please. We had another driver come out this morning, the UK Supreme Court ruling. Now. You can see how we're running right on resistance right at the moment, the 38.2 of this major move. It started here at the beginning of September. Now, I'm taking the low that was set just earlier last week or uh, just earlier last week. And the reason is because this spike low, it could be a little bit weird if you remember that flash crash. I mean, I don't know what liquidity existed down here when we were in the midst of this 500 pip dead drop. So 
I don't want to look at that as a you know really well confirmed a low, given that this thing was kind of in a state of inertia at the at that point. I mean, gravity didn't exist here, so this is just a matter of where market makers are willing to price it. So I drew it up to this low, and lo and behold, since that low came in just a couple of days ago, we have seen price action working with that fib retracement fairly well. The 23.6 gave quite a bit of run here, a little bit of resistance throughout 23.30. And the level that's really interesting right now is the 382 of that move, uh, right up here at 2543. Notice how we caught a top just yesterday. It was ahead of that high court ruling. And maybe even a little bit of sell off in anticipation of that high court ruling. Uh, we've moved right back up to that level of resistance at this point. So I would consider this short term in, in a bullish type of posture, especially after we had the support check off a of prior point of resistance. Right, this thing. It, it, just doesn't have the ammunition to make this move yet, but given the reaction we had today, it, it does look as though the fundamental backdrop for continued bullishness is there. Now, a couple of different ways to play this one right now. If we break below this swing low, this fairly significant swing low that came in about 2417 from yesterday, I don't know that I'd want to move forward in a bullish manner. So this becomes helpful for stop placement, right? Like if I do get a significant break below the zone, I don't want to be holding on to long positions because I have the fear that this momentum may not be playing out. So right there, got a little support level to work with. So what I could do is I could simply base this a little bit higher. See how we have these little sub swings down here off this hourly chart? Let me zoom in a little bit so it's a little more apparent, a little easier to see there. So I'm going to take this off like the five minute. There we go. See how this little swing this morning? Had a little swing down there yesterday morning. Had a little bit of action taking place there yesterday. So if I do get a swing down in this region, I'm going to stop below there and look for this to play back up towards this level of resistance, which is about 2543. Now, if we don't get that support check down here, as in if this thing does just bubble up, continue running, that's cool too. No problem. There's a way to play it. Uh, I do want to be a little bit more conservative though if I am going to be trading with outside price action, as in I, I don't necessarily want to play a straight breakout here where I'm just going to look to get long with a break above resistance. Instead, I want to do something like I want to let this actually develop, actually work, because notice we did see quite a bit of price action in November and December coming up north of 26, south of 27. Right, we did have a nice little 100 pip zone in there. So I don't want to get too aggressive with this thing just yet. But if it can break out of this 2543 level, let it go. Let it go, let it go, let it go. And then I want to see where I might be able to pick up support in the zone from halfway in this zone, right about 25 flat, up to whatever higher low comes in there. Okay. So if it doesn't come down to check support, that's fine. Let it break, let it run, and then try to buy higher low support once we get outside. That's the other way I want to look to handle the cable right now. And again, until we really take out 2750, 2775, you know, I don't know that this is going to be a, you know, a, a, a dead red and bullish setup that I'm going to have to treat like I had to treat, you know, some of those yen setups in Q4 last year, where you know, really I got to negotiate with myself to find retracements. Uh, but that's the first setup I want to look at for today. British pound against the U.S. dollar. Um, let's see a question from Foy Saw. Hi, James Long pounding in a couple of days ago, but regret big time coming out of this pair. I thought I was going to have a good pullback, but it's going up, up, and up. What's your look on this thing and the yen? Uh, I got quite a bit on the yen. We're going to go over a little bit later. Um, got a CAD yen setup I want to look at. I got a pound yen setup I want to look at. So we've got some yen to, to work with. Uh, Dan M says market maker will go for that low before advancing up. I mean, it depends, you know. I mean, market makers don't have infinite infinite equity lines, you know, so they can't push something down 5,000 pips to clear stop before they let it go back up, you know. So the devil's kind of in the details of those market maker types of runs, um, you know. Real generally, the way that I try to associate with that is if I'm going to use a stop or on a swing. You know, I think kind of what you're alluding to here. Uh, I'm not going to put that right at the swing, right? Because again, every market maker on planet Earth sees that, and so if we get down and we're like, you know, two pips off, and we're in the Asian session and there's you know, nothing else going, well then yeah, there could be one of those situations where we could see a market maker trying to drive price down, trigger those stops, clear off their side of the trade, and then let that thing rip. So you know, the one area that I'll try to plan around that is with stop placement, 
because it could just be real obvious if places stops around these swings that other market makers are seeing as well. Okay, so US dollar, we've been looking at this one for a while. Now, near term, this hasn't yet shown any signs of bullishness, okay? But I'm watching it while it's in the zone, trying to see some signs of life. It just hasn't shown any yet. Okay, I thought we might get some yesterday when we were trickling around this 100 level. We didn't. Further break. Notice how we had the support come in just a little bit above this Fibonacci level, which is the 50% retracement of the Trump trade or the post-election move. Now, so far on an hourly basis, it's been rather encouraging. We're just not quite there yet. Notice how we had a nice little trend line that it developed yesterday, but then boom, right back down. So, uh, the the very early near-term thing that I'm watching right now to see if this gives us a higher low from this, which isn't going to be confirmed until we actually get a higher high above this. So if I get a, a price action break of 100 spot 43 on DXY, then I have the first sign that maybe we're starting to see some reversal in this bearish retracement of that bullish dollar trend. And then I can move forward with the idea that this was the higher low from here. And then I can look to play out those long dollar strategies, right? Make sure I fit the nail on the head. And then a dollar yen would be sweet. That's that's kind of where I'm looking to do it. Uh, I got another area that I'm watching right now, and uh, Chris Roby had hit this one, said nice sell-off in dollar cat. It was a nice sell-off in dollar cat. It was an aggressive sell-off in dollar cat, too. Um, this thing bounced off of a fairly consistent trend line. Uh, we've been watching this channel for a while now, right in here. And from the May lows, you can see where price action dollar cat really stuck to this channel fairly well for most of the time. The problem started to come about you know, just about a week and a half ago when we started to get this downside break of the trend channel and notice how prior support then became new resistance. But another BOC meeting, another, uh, I don't want to say tease, but another uh, say innuendo that some monetary stimulus may be coming before too long out of the Bank of Canada. Uh, gave us some CAD weakness, brought us right back. Now this built in a pretty beautiful evening star formation. Uh, bullish candle, doji, bearish candle, halfway down the body of the first. But notice how that, that doji in the middle of that evening star just inflected beautifully off this trend line that makes up the bottom portion of this channel. Let's go down a little tighter. And it was almost like a light switch was flipped, right? That bullish price action in dollar CAD run up to this trend line, now it's bearish price action, dollar CAD. Now, the reason I'm watching this isn't to look at bearish USD plays. It's similar to what Sharif was speaking of a moment ago, looking for ways to try to see around the corner, okay? Now, as I shared a little earlier, I'm not of the mind that this dollar trend is completely over yet. I, I think we still have quite a bit of room to run. And I think more proactively, if we look at the fundamental spectrum right now, if we go around the world, which economies are actually looking at higher rates? That is the preeminent driver of currency trends, rates. Now, we may have gotten a little ahead of ourselves with the, with the dollar trade post-Trump. And this was something I was saying all along, especially two weeks after. But now it's starting to feel as though we've went a little bit too far with pricing that back out, right? Because nothing's really reversed here. The only thing that's changed is Donald Trump's become inaugurated. That's it. He hasn't changed his stance, he hasn't changed his policy, Chair Yellen hasn't changed her policies, her stance, or anything. The only clue that we've had is that one little interview that Donald Trump had with the Wall Street Journal a couple of, well, a week ago, where he questioned the strong dollar policy. That's it. That's all we have. I wouldn't even call that a clue yet. I call that a suspicious event. So, in that effort of looking around the corner, playing a, 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 a dichotomy, if you will, between constituents of a currency pair, this is one that I still want to follow, right? Because the Canadian economy is, is still grappling with a strong Canadian dollar. So much so that these higher oil prices aren't really bringing a lot of benefit because that strong Canadian dollar is wiping away a lot of the, a lot of the gains. And so this is why we've heard the BOC mention the prospect of monetary stimulus now two different times, right? And each time it's when dollar CAD's getting towards this 130 level here we had back in October. We were like five pips off of 130, going to the BOC uh, press conference after the rate decision, and Stephen Polo says, oh, well, we talked about monetary stimulus, and then notice how this thing just jumps 
right up to 3575 in really short order. We had the same type of thing last week, same deal. You see CAD sell off really quickly, and, and I think the reason is because I'm not the only one that's expecting the BOC to do something at some point. The question is when, and that's where Stephen Polos has been really tough to, to nail down. But this 130 level has proven over a couple of different cases to be really strong here on dollar CAD, and this is something that I could use as a type of dis, uh, like a decision level, if you will. Uh, Chris Roby says Polos was hawkish in December. Well, he walked back his monetary stimulus. He said they're not ready to do that yet. Um, I believe he even tried to do that shortly after this BOC rate decision. I think it was like a week or two after. Uh, dollar CAD's running up to 135, and he actually went out there and said, yeah, I think we're thinking like 18 months that they're about. And he tried to give a little bit of clarity to it. And that's what helped bring this, you know, some strength back into the CAD, bring the pair right back down. Uh, but, you know, mid-December, Fed hiked rates. CAD got weak again. Right back up to 35.75. So there's some other stuff going on there, right? I mean, at least price action would indicate as such. Um, nonetheless, I have a level down here around 130 that I could work with. Right? It's been proven a few different times. Every time dollar CAD gets down there, it's had a tendency to get jumpy. So this is something that I can start to plan around. I'm going to take this a step further. I'm also going to add in this level right here, this 23.6 percent Fibonacci retracement. And the reason I want this one is because that 38.2 seemed to work out fairly well. So the 23.6, that same chain may be able to give me some support. Okay, now let's zoom out. Daily chart. All right, there we go. So as long as I can see support developing above this, then I can move forward with a relatively bullish view. As far as timing the entry on this, that's going to be a little more challenging given that we are in the process of dropping. I don't want to catch a knife as in the process of falling. Uh, instead, I'm going to let this thing actually set support, actually begin to move up, and actually start to set some higher lows here on this hourly chart. I think it might take a little while longer. Like I said, I, I, we could see a deeper cut down into the support zone, so I'm not just you know, itching at the trigger finger to just buy this right now. But this is definitely one that I want to keep on the radar in the effort of trading that long USD or that bullish USD trend if we do see support coming back into DXY. Okay, so those are the majors around the dollar with uh, Sterling and CAD. There's a few other ways that we could look at going about matters. Um, pound CAD is a uh, fairly interesting on a longer term basis. Let's start out with the monthly chart and just walk this down. Okay, so you can see where the Brexit discussion, the 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 Brexit fear, you know, really hit this pair. It got us down towards these relative all time lows. Now, when we were down at these all time lows, notice how choppy this thing was for like a few years. But from those swing lows, we could get a decent little trend line. I say a decent little trend line because we had seen, you know, some element of respect off that projection just, you know, a couple weeks ago. But same kind of thing, right? If you look at that dollar CAD short-term chart, you look at this pound CAD intermediate-term chart, there's not really a lot of bullishness yet. We've had a quick stretch after setting a new intermediate-term low. You see in here, we even have some symmetry. Let's go down to a four hour and draw a trim line. There we go, there's that symmetry. All right, so now I have a way of kind of deciding how I can begin to gauge bullishness in this pair. So in essence, uh, I've tried to coalesce the two themes that I've already spoken about, the prospect of bullishness coming into the British pound uh, on the back of well, the reversal of the prior bearish theme and then you know, also running on this new information that we have this morning. Uh, Parliament's going to need to be consulted before Theresa make a trade with Article 50, thereby 
giving her political opponents a little bit of sway in how they might actually be able to do it. And we also have the prospect of cat weakness, right, as we were just looking at a moment ago. Right now, the trend goes exactly against, or has been longer term, goes exactly against what I'm looking for. And so if I have that situation of divergence where reality or prices are doing something different than what I expect them or want them to do, well, I have no trade. So I have two alternatives. Either one, I shift my vantage point, which I already shared with you. I feel pretty good about that. Or two, I wait for price action. I wait for reality to match that. One way I could do that is by looking at something like this trend line and mandating that price action needs to break above this prior bearish trend line before I'm going to move forward with a bullish approach. Okay? That's one way of doing it. Another is if you look just before this thing hit terminal velocity on the way down, we had a decent little batch of resistance up here, right? Notice all of those wicks. This is a four hour chart. I could go to a daily, it's going to be kind of the same, less granular, but it'll be there. Right? You can see where we have all of this heat. So there was something going on there. What exactly? I don't know. Maybe there's a fib level there. Maybe there's some, you know, magic level there. Who knows? Whatever it was, a lot of resistance had developed in this area. Now it has me really cautious is that all of a sudden reality has begun to reflect my vantage point when it hadn't for so long. Right? So we have what appears to be a change of pace taking place here with our prior bearish trend is moving in a really bullish manner. So use this as a decision level. Say, all right, if this thing is going to be so bullish, then it should actually break through. It should actually break through that trend line. Then if it does, kind of like I was looking at on pound dollar, don't just chase it. Don't just buy it. Let it run. And again, this might take a week. It might take a month. I don't care. The point is to let it show you the buyers are going to be able to start to take control of the situation here. And then once they do, that's when I can look to buy higher or low support, which will often develop in a zone around prior resistance. Okay, so same kind of deal here. I don't want to use near-term stimuli or something that's really just been happening for a week to make a determination on something that I'm looking for the next few months. When you see something that has been happening for a week, okay, well, that's where it becomes an observable event, something that I might be able to use in the near term. But until that lines up, it's not there yet. Now, there is one that's a little bit closer for me, and this is one of the few ways that I have where I actually want to buy CAD right now, and that's against the Japanese yen, and then after this, we'll go into some of these yen setups that... Uh, I'm seeing a ton of questions around. Okay, so before we get to CAD yen, let's just do a quick run on dollar yen. Um, I'm using this as kind of the primer for the overall or the bigger picture yen trade. And you know, to me, this is very similar to that dollar trade. We put in a huge move really fast, all up too far pretty fast for most intents and purposes. And now we're in the process of collection, retracing some of that trend. And yeah, think about just think about the other side of that, right? Think about when you're in this trend, when you're running with one of these moves, right? And let's just say you got in at 106. Now we're up at 116. 116 up there. You got a thousand pips in the trade. Are you looking to buy more? Maybe, but most people won't be. Most people will be scared. They got a thousand pips on the trade. They're ready for it to reverse. Right, the litmus for continued gains gets higher the higher price moves. Right? As in, once we get up to 118.61, if we want to get an additional 100 pips, we're going to need a significantly more positive driver to get that 100 pips than what we'd need to get 100 pips off that 106 or 105 entry. Right? And the reason is because of sentiment. Once we get up to 118, a lot of folks are already long, as given from the fact that demand has driven prices higher. So if we are going to get an extra 100 pips, we need to see new buyers come into the market. And if there are no new buyers left in the market, well, it doesn't matter how good the news was. 
there's no buyers coming in to push prices higher. Some of those long positions are probably going to want to close, realize some profits, and prices come down. This is why sentiment could be a really important thing to follow, right? Now, there's the Trump trade right in here, okay? The 38.2% retracement of that move is right here at 111.95. Notice that we didn't quite get all the way down there, okay? But there's the retracement of the Trump trade, and what's really interesting is this swing low right down here, okay? So just look at this on the four-hour chart, lower low, lower high, lower low, lower high, lower low. And we popped up, made a slightly higher high. You can see where buyers try to support it, they just couldn't get it yet. Okay, so that lower low is slightly lower than this swing down here. And I know it's just a pip or two, and depending on who you're asking, it may or may not invalidate that. I do invalidate it. I'm a stickler for this type of stuff. So I'm not looking at this as a, I got to buy it right now type of scenario. The only thing that would get me in that spot is if we break back above this swing high that it just barely tweezed that prior swing high. Okay? Until then, I want to see more information or wait for more information. One other way that I could look to do it is if I could get a break above 114, and then if I could see some element of resistance between 114 to 115, or 114.50 to 115, then I could look to buy a higher low at 114 so that I could get a stop low at 112.50. But unless that happens, I'm not... Again, I don't have that itchy trigger finger looking to buy dollar yen after we made what's technically a lower low just yesterday. It is constructive. It could be constructive, but I need more information before I'm going to look for a trend reload set there. Now let's combine that yen posture over into another pair, like CAD yen. And now we could potentially get a couple of different things. I'm, I'm looking for an incursion of yen weakness, okay? Um, CAD's been rather strong of late. Like I said, this is one of the few setups I have where I could actually look for a stronger Canadian dollar. And kind of like we were looking at a moment ago with pound CAD, although on a much shorter term, we have a trend line. It's now indicating, see this bearish trend line? Just broke above, now indicating a trend change. So that thing I showed you just a moment ago on a longer term basis, and I can show you how I could try to trade it on a shorter term basis. See, it's a little more developed here because we have that same type of, of, of pound CAD setup. Bearish counter trend trend line, short term, bigger picture trend side move, right? This thing's run really fast. I don't want to chase it. Instead, this prior point zone of resistance. Come a novel area to look for some support. Can even cut it a little bit deeper, a little bit lower. There we go. Cut it a little bit deeper, a little bit lower. Notice how we had prior batch of support, 86.11. All right, this is really short term, but a couple different levels that I could work with here. And looking for that, looking for that bullish reversal, that near-term bearish theme. And so this would be a maybe a quicker way of looking to get some yen exposure for right now, when those yen trends are still feeling a little bit immature, um, at least for continuation purposes. And that, my friends, is what I have for today. Uh, Want to see what kind of questions you, ladies and gentlemen, have? Please don't hesitate to ask me. Anything trading related? <laughs> okay, uh, Pete said uh, if he wants to look at some Aussie dollar, we could definitely do that. Um, let's pull up some Aussie. So I got a lot of friends that work in the industry, but don't work uh, in FX. They work in like you know equities or fixed income or whatever. But you know what's surprising is, is is how many folks do stuff related to FX that might not necessarily be directly FX centric. 
a lot of stuff going on in the Aussie right now, and uh, I have a sneaking suspicion it's because of China. But we often fall victim to time frames, right? Like if I look at this on the hourly, we got a nice, smooth, strong trend. But you know, we go back on like a daily, and you know, it's it's kind of choppy, right? There's not really necessarily a bullish uptrend here as much as a reaction to a prior bearish move. And then you know we scroll out a little bit more, and it's like, okay, well, all of this is collection from a real big picture long-term bearish move. So in essence, if we're trading this on the daily chart, hourly chart, we're trading in, you know, kind of a derivative of the bigger picture theme. But let's go out even further. Let's go to the monthly. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to first start this off with what I call the lifetime fib. Take this low in April of 2001. I'm going to draw it up to this top in July of 2011. Uh, notice how the 61.8% retracement of that move comes in right here, 71.84. It's a big, big level. And that's what's been helping us to catch support for about the last seven, eight months. We've got another really important move right in here. That's the financial collapse right there. Um, let me differentiate this. Make this nice and dark. So it's very obvious when we uh, we drill down. Now I'm going to do a sub fib. I'm going to call the secondary major move. Same 2011 top. Just this time we're going to use the financial collapse low. And we'll go with the skinny blue lines now. Okay. So now with second Fibonacci, completely unrelated move, right? So we have the big picture major move right in here. We have the sub move right in here, taking the financial collapse low. And notice how we have confluence at these two levels. About 79 and change, then a little bit above 72. All right, now we look at this on the weekly chart. And you can even see where we have like some sub resistance showing up. And here, right? So, you know, basically, for the last few months, we've had more or less an Australian dollar range, right? It seems like a trend. If we get down on the hourly or the four-hour chart, but if we get here, you know, bigger picture, look at this with a lot of data. In essence, we're basically watching a range. This thing's trying to resolve itself. Now, which direction, longer term, I don't know. I think that's going to likely be determined on the economic scope of China. As in, if China does see another expansionary phase, I think that's going to inevitably end up bringing a, a, a more expensive Australian dollar to the mix. Um, but if we don't, which I think is is a very real prospect as well, then we could be seeing some longer-term pressure developing the Australian dollar as you know what's happened over the last eight years. Maybe like a mirage, right? Because really, in the post-financial collapse environment, a, a lot of money was directed towards China, and China was able to uh, use that capital. Of course, a lot of that capital is going to flow over to Australia um, in the form of uh, natural resources or you know business transactions, deals, etc. I mean, there's an, an, an inextricably a strong link between Australia and China. As China is continuing to face a little bit more pressure, as Australian rates we're in a rather odd spot. The RBA can't necessarily just cut rates so easily because they have the fear of uh, prodding a even bigger bubble in housing. You know, they can't necessarily uh, run rates higher right now. So, you know, it's going to be real interesting to see what Philip Lowe does with Australian rate policy. Maybe in the second quarter this year, maybe the third. You know, that's that's about when I think folks are beginning to expect that he's actually going to start saying some stuff. Um, but, you know, to me, this is a longer-term collection move. This is still trying to decide which direction it wants to go. I know where my battle lines are, and that's about all that I have here. I think what's ultimately going to turn or burn this thing is going to be China. I think that's the bigger question. I think that's the, you know, kind of the, the bigger issue for the Antipodians at the moment. Uh, but good question, my man. You know I'll get that Aussie in there for you. All right, so uh, awesome. Got another question from Pete. Um, seems these marks are really jittery, hesitant, and many of the moves are delayed. 
UK vote, US PMIs, etc. Um, awesome point. I wholeheartedly agree. Um, since the turn of the new year, my uh, activity has been down considerably, and it's not been because of effort. It's been I simply haven't been able to find setups that I'm you know that big of a fan of. And I think one of the reasons is because I've gotten pretty locked in on a couple of trends, uh, yen specifically, and that thing hasn't really shown much life just yet. Um, so yeah, agree with you. I think that. Well, here, let me take a step back. The reason that I'm not too concerned about any of this is because I think it's just a, you know, a, a small pullback in the bigger picture trend of the move. You know, if we look here at the at the U.S. dollar long term, the move that we put in in Q4 last year was historic. I mean, it was it was out of this world to see such a strong move so fast on such a stimuli that most folks hadn't expected. They expected the exact opposite of. So, you know, after we got this resistance break, I was a little surprised that sellers didn't come in quicker. You know, but it was kind of like the perfect compendium of forces. We had the election here, strong bump. And then we had the ECB going another round here. A week later, we had the Fed. You know, so we really kind of daisy-chained these events together to drive the dollar maybe higher than it would have been otherwise. So, you know, that's another reason that I'm retaining a bullish stance here on the greenback, looking to buy some support, looking for continuation thesis. Um, you know, I just don't think that we've had another topside driver show itself, you know. It's, it's nothing's really showed itself yet. You know, we haven't had a lot of yelling talk. Uh, when she did talk a couple of weeks ago, that brought some life back into the dollar for like a day or two. Um, was it last week, maybe the week before? It was a Thursday of memory serves. Um, but yeah, it seems like we're just waiting on that next on that next data point, the next end window. Um, when that might be, I don't know. Um, markets aren't pricing anything from the Fed until June, so there's a lot of work there's a lot of room that they could run it there. You know, like if we get one of these uh, Fed speakers or these um, Fed voters that you know says, hey, maybe March, and then I think we could get get some life in the dollar really quick. Until then, I, you know, I think it's kind of a waiting game for the next shoe to drop to get folks excited for the next rate hike. Ah, my bad voice all. Wanted to look at pound yen. I didn't even get that. Um, yeah, let's take a quick quick look at pound yen. All right, so talk about a pair that's uh, started to come back to life. So we gapped down pretty aggressively last week uh, ahead of Theresa May's Brexit speech. And this hit a fairly significant level at 136.62. That was the 50% retracement of that most recent major move, taking the October low uh, up to that post-Trump high uh, right here, middle of December. 50 fib right there, 136.62. All right, hourly chart. There we go. Notice how we had another one of those little trend lines developing. This one was kind of messy. Right, but we have this stable horizontal support, descending trend line, gives us a descending wedge formation. We just broke out of that uh, a little bit ago, and it looks like this thing's starting to get back into that bullish type of framework. Look at this on the four hour chart, I think it's a little easier to see. There we go. Okay, so there's that smooth, consistent, steady yen trend, personified really well against the British pound here. Uh, tail into November, going into December. I mean, it's just so smooth; it makes life real easy. Went to buy low, and you know, don't really question it all that much. Uh, you know, thing is with pound yen, I think turns, so you don't want to get in that. Uh, you don't want to get to that level of comfort really ever with this pair. Now, once it starts to break down, you can see where the bulls weren't ready to let it die, but they weren't able to hold the line. That retracement cut a little bit deeper, and kind of what we were looking at in the U.S. dollar, where excitement kind of allowed everybody to get ahead of themselves back here and back here and back here. You know, and you can see the same type of narrative playing out numerous times a year where, you know, something new happens, we get a new high, and we get a higher low, and then prices start to run, and then, uh oh, the world's changing, everything's shifting, I gotta get long, I gotta get long. And then, you know, notice how these support points get less and less deep. Right? Eventually we're going to get up here and we're not even really going to test prior resistance levels. Right? We just run and then prices go down and the buyers, they don't even want to wait. That's when you know, things are getting a little bit stretched, a little bit silly. And uh, that's when you'll start to see things like RSI divergence, stochastic divergence, um, 
you know, you'll you'll start to get you know a lot of blind fades up here. One of blind fades. I mean, folks just saying, oh, well, it hit 147, so I'm going to sell it. Okay, good luck. Um, here, let me get rid of that trend line. I think it's kind of messing things up for us. There we go. Okay, but you can almost see. Right, don't look at candle by candle. Just try to get the general gist of price action. You can almost see where this thing just changes as if a light switch was turned off, right? Bearish. Bullish, right? Now, when we get this trend, it's not like every price is going to be bullish. It's not like every hourly bar is going to be bullish. But, you know, it's the general gist, right? The trend, if you will, the bias of the market at a time. And pound yen, when the trend gets to moving strong, it can be rather clear, right? Downtrend, uptrend, downtrend. Congestion, uptrend, downtrend. Right now we're in that congestion phase, but you can see where it's looking like it wants to get back into uptrend phase, right? As these sellers react a little bit more aggressively, a little bit more aggressively, notice these buyers are just holding the line right there at 140 spot 80. And those buyers held in for so long that all of that selling pressure has been absorbed and now prices are ready to rip or have started to rip. 142.87 is a level that could give a little bit of near-term resistance. If this thing hits, and I'm talking on a short-term basis here, like an hourly chart or below, if this thing hits 142.87, I want to let price run up and then come back down, and then I want to try to catch support in the zone of prior resistance right around 142.17 up to about 142.35. So way shorter term, but a way that I can still work with the move and the effort of getting a longer-term retracement higher, or excuse me, a longer-term reversal of this bearish retracement higher. Uh, from Monir, do you see the drop in CAD today uh, continuing or just temporary? I, I think he means um, drop in dollar CAD, uh, strength in CAD, especially given that Trump will bring NAFTA into discussion again. Um, I think the trade deals take a long time to price through, you know. Trade deals take a long time to actually go through. Um, you know, I, I think it's right for uh, you know, the big investment banks to try to position in ahead of that stuff, you know, it only makes sense, right? Like if, you know, if I'm an investment banker and I have, say, RBC Canada as one of my clients, you know, it would be haphazard for me to not go to them and say, hey, guys, so look, got this NAFTA thing, it might be going away. So we need to come up with an alternative game plan here, right? That would be warranted, I think. For me, I mean, I'm, you know, Sitting at home in New York City, just looking to hit a trigger to try to get into a trade. I don't know that I necessarily want to trade on a you know implications of a NAFTA deal that might be two, three, four years out on you know, currency pair that's right here right now. Um, so you know, to me, I think that a lot of those fundamental—I'm not even going to call it a fundamental theme. I'm going to call it a you know political ideas might be a little bit disconnected from near-term price action, for me at least. Um, you know, so I don't doubt if we saw an announcement that, let's say, Trump scrapped NAFTA, if that happened, um, that we would see CAD, PESO take a hit. It's more that I don't expect myself to be able to predict that or get in front of it. So I'm not even going to waste my time trying. Instead, I'm going to focus on what I can work with, what I do know I have at my disposal. That's price action, right? And and the reason and the, the reason this stays linked is because of market efficiency, right? The guys at Goldman, they're not stupid. If, you know, if we do see Trump looking to, let's say, scrap NAFTA, those guys at Goldman, they're already talking to their Canadian clients, they're already positioning those Canadian clients around what they think they need to be doing. That's going to show up on my chart. If that means weak, uh, weaker Canadian dollar, that's going to start trickling in here because these markets are relatively efficient over the long term. So, you know, that's one of the reasons that I don't get all bought up in a lot of this political stuff that goes on because to me as a trader, a lot of it's very disconnected from my day-to-day -day and what I do. And, you know, and, and some are related. Um, I've noticed some of the most talented traders that I've ever known get completely lost and disconnected because of their adherence to politics. You know, they get so bought into a candidate or an idea or a movement or whatever that now it's impacting their bias. It's impacting the way that they look at a market. They look at this and they're like, there's no way I'm going to buy the Canadian dollar because Donald Trump's going to repeal NAFTA. We don't know that. Your job as a trader is not to prognosticate what's going to happen to NAFTA. It's to 
follow price action, or at least that's the way I look at it. So, you know, I'm going to take what I can get. If I can't see it, I'm not going to get too, uh, too emotional about it. I'm not going to get too, um, too bought into it. Um, I do think the next four years are going to bring a lot of political volatility. As a trader, that's something I'm not necessarily afraid of because volatility could be a good thing for me. So bring it on. It does mean I'll be wrong more often, but it also means that when I'm right, I could also be a lot more right because prices might run a little bit longer, farther, faster, etc. Uh, from Stephen S., fundamentally, investment firms in Canada forecast long-term dollar CAD to rise 1.4 to 1.45 in 12 months. What's your view? Um, with all due respect, bank forecasts are often way wrong. Um, and, you know, don't believe me. Just type in euro dollar parity and, you know, type in the biggest banks and see, you know, all who's whiffed on that call. You know, and it's, a, it's another point, I think, of... Uh, Again, I don't want to be disrespectful here, but to me, bank forecast, bank data, bank research, it's noisy, right? That data, that research, that's produced for a certain level, a certain type of clientele. Uh, you know, the guy that's looking to play swing trades every morning, <laughs> that's not that's not for me. Um, you know, and then on that front, these banks aren't always going to be right. They're often wrong. And that's kind of what I was alluding to with the Bureau of Parity comment a little bit earlier. These banks are often wrong. You know, if I put myself in a position where I'm only right when the bank is right, and then I'm lucky enough to be right as well, well I'm gonna, probably going to have a pretty bad time because now I'm going to be wrong when the bank's wrong, and I'm going to be wrong some of the time that the bank's right, and I just didn't trade it correctly. So bank forecasts, neither here nor there to me. Um, as far as prognosticating trends, etc., I think the bigger impact, and I think this is what a lot of these banks are taking into account, is they they're, they are expecting to see that monetary divergence take place, where you know Trump has the USA first type of mantra, the potential repeal of NAFTA, uh, or you know at the very least um, you know modification of NAFTA, it, it combined with Canadian monetary stimulus, because Justin Trudeau's strategy hasn't appeared to work too much thus far. You know, all of that is good and fine. But you know, I'm of the belief if this was really compelling research, we already would have seen this begun to price in in dollar CAD, right? We wouldn't be you know hovering around the 130 level right now. We would have broken out above these highs, and we didn't. You know, so if if um, you know, and I'm not going to name any specific banks, but if a bank publishes something that says dollar CAD should be at a dollar 40 to dollar 45, then buy it. You know, if you believe that, then buy it. And furthermore, you shouldn't be telling people because now you're giving away your strategy, you're giving away your good stuff if you believed it, right? If all due respect for those banks, though, I mean they do, you know, in many cases they do a good job for their clients. But if you're reading that bank research that wasn't sent to you from that bank, you are not the design client for that research. You got to be careful with it. Uh, from Scott Pearson, uh, James, is there a way of setting price alarms for prices to trend line on trading? View like five pips away, for example. So I'm alerted in time. I only know how to do it with the line itself. Um, which is there, so there's there's a little way here, Scott. It's gonna be it, it's it's gonna be kind of weird. Okay, what you can do. So the problem that we have is that if I use a horizontal line, it's only gonna be applicable to a couple of bars, right? Because that price is gonna diverge when the trend line is moving, and then the horizontal level is not, right? You can do a parallel line, five pips inside. Oops. There we go. You sit down the control key on your trend line itself will give you a parallel and you could do it just a little bit inside now you set the alert on that one now you set the alert on that one right so now you can get a, a little early warning sign uh, from Falarin, uh, what is the significance of the dollar index? I just don't understand it yet. Forgive my ignorance please. First off, there's no ignorance here man. You're all good. It's okay. Um, I think self-deprecation is something that could be really damaging to a trader. It's okay to not know stuff, right? Some of the best traders I know don't know all the jargon. They don't know all of the bank stuff because they weren't raised in the bank. You know, if you're raised in the bank, you learn to look at things the way everybody else looks at things, and then you don't really have, you know, uh, much, much, much that's unique. 
about the approach we bring to the table. So all good. The significance of the dollar is to currency traders, the dollar is in every single major pair that's out there. Okay? So major pairs like euro dollar or pound dollar. Euro dollar or pound dollar. Or even like dollar CAD. Some people call it a commodity currency, I call it a major. Um, the dollar's in all of those pairs, right? That's the one central theme that kind of keeps everything together. The dollar is uh, one of the most heavily traded assets in the world, so that's just another reason that it gets so much attention. Um, and many major markets are based in US dollars, like gold, for instance. Treasuries. So in a lot of ways, the dollar is the center and I don't want this to sound, you know, U.S. centric from a dude in the U.S., but the dollar is the center of the financial universe. It's also a bad thing, um, because of what we were alluding to a little bit earlier, right? Where, with the U.S. being one of the few economies looking at tighter rate policy, looking at higher rates, it exposes the dollar to, forgive me for saying it, but ill-gotten gains, right? Folks that are just looking to make a couple of bucks on a currency trade, like me. I'll buy into the dollar in anticipation of it going up. And in essence, that's going to make it harder for the U.S. to do business. So USD is, again, kind of the center of the financial world. Um, that's not necessarily a great thing. Not necessarily a great thing, but it is considered the global reserve currency. Uh, from Pete, <laughs> my pleasure, my friend. Absolutely my pleasure. Um, from Chris Roby, I have a question about trading commissions. I've been trading a hundred dollar CAD, and commission should be five, but it's seven. Okay, so commission spreads um, that's going to differ from broker to broker, and there is compliance and regulatory concerns around that stuff. And I don't know exactly what setup or broker that you're with, Chris. So I don't want to misspeak and give you wrong information. Um, it, it, again, it depends on the broker because a lot of brokers are going to have the, their their commission within the spread, so it's going to be a wider spread. Others are going to have a, a split commission with a tighter spread, more or less. Um, but dollar cat shouldn't be more than a few wide, especially if you're if you're trading size on it. Oh, and I see that question coming in from Scott again. Um, so guys, sorry if I'm a little slow on the questions. Uh, sometimes I'll belabor a little bit when we get to the Q and A, um, but I just wanted to answer this again because I had another kind of kind of point on this. So when you do want to set these trend lines, then you want to get an early warning sign of a trend line hit. You know, you can go a little bit inside, a little bit outside, and then you set the alert in on the kind of the false one. Um, be careful with the SMS alerts. You get real, real, real annoying, um, especially if you set it. Where is it? There we go. Like, not to once, but like, re on every minute, re on every thirty minutes. Um, I say that because I set one of these alarms that I wasn't expecting to hit, and then it was like weird. I was at a Christmas party with my wife, and then my phone kept going off like every second. I couldn't make it stop. It created a pretty Pretty bad Christmas party for uh, well for me because of my wife. Uh, she wasn't too happy about it. Anyways, just wanted to you know throw that out there because once we set these alerts, they are going to be there until you go into Trading View, modify your alerts, and actually delete that alert. Uh, from Adam A. Hi James, you always use FXCM to trade forex. Are there any other platforms you can recommend where you can trade forex in other markets? Thanks. Um, so this is a, a really tough question for me to address. I mean, I just wanted to bring it up because um, I've, I've seen it asked a few times. I didn't want anybody to think I'm being evasive on it. So I work for Daily Effects, which is the research arm of IG in London. So I am paid by a broker. So I can't give you, um, I can't, of course, recommend competitors, and I can't personally trade on IG because I am a U.S. resident. I'm not a U.K. resident. So I can't even really recommend them. Um, so I, I'm sorry, but I can't really help out a lot in this regards, uh, for especially for U.S. clients. Um, what I will say is that uh, regulations have changed things considerably. 
Um, when I started trading FX, it was one of those things where I had to do a considerable amount of legwork on every broker that I was looking at because, well, because, um, at least from where I said in the United States, it appears the regulations change that significantly. Um, but my situation is going to be a little bit different because I'm classified as a professional, because I'm employed by a broker, and because um, uh, because I am paid by IG. Uh, I do not, Edgar. <laughs> All right, folks. Let's see if we've got the last question of the day. I'm going to try to find one nice and juicy. Good market related here. I've got a certain market that I'm hoping somebody asks about. But if they're not, I'm not going to try to fit a square peg in a round hole. Greta, that's an awesome, awesome feedback. I love it. Very sane opinion. Love your webinars. Thank you. I'm trying to find. Okay, so I am going to put a square peg in around. <laughs> There's one other market that I wanted to talk about and I hadn't gotten to touch on, and I was expecting. There was two people in particular I was expecting to ask about it. They didn't ask about it, but I'm not disappointed. It's all good. It's a euro yen. So. <clears throat> The reason that I really like this one is because I think that this could have some of the same qualities of what I was looking at on that Palinian setup, but maybe maybe a little bit cleaner, maybe a little less, um, for lack of a better term, violent. I think that the uh, you know the, the Brexit situation is just so incredibly opaque, so incredibly unclear that you know I think doing anything longer term in the British pound that isn't price action base, at least for me right now, is daunting. Euro is a little bit of a more interesting story, especially after what we've seen with European QE. Right? I think that this is something that on a macro or a funding basis, we are going to see some strength in this year. And I think that the reason why is because the ECB is basically throwing the kitchen sink at this QE thing. And A, it doesn't look as though they're going to have the need to do a whole lot more, at least hopefully not. And even if they needed to, it doesn't look as though they're going to have the ability to do a whole lot more. Um, and there's a lot of room for this thing to, to, to run here in Euro Yen. So right when China began to implode around summer of last, uh, summer two years ago now, uh, it began to hit the Yen as well. Notice this Yen strength coming in from about 141 on Euro Yen all the way down to the sub 110, really short period of time. Uh, but same kind of story, right? Cut that quick wick around Brexit, substantiated a little base of support, began to look like it was going to start running higher. You know, whenever I have one of these, if I want to do a quick check to see, you know, how relevant is that compared to that, well, I'll just fib it. Check out what part of the major move that was. And, uh, all right, which is cool. It's constructive. Uh, we're above the 38.2, below the 50, so we haven't completely negated this bearish move yet. Now we go in a little bit tighter. Daily chart. There we go. Okay, what got this back on my radar was uh, ECB December when they did go in for that additional round, that that uh, additional throw of QE. And, and look at the way that this thing responded. It was... Uh, you know what? I was incorrect. It's right here. That was the ECB day, which was even better though because we had this support response off 118.50 a couple of days earlier. The ECB basically throws the kitchen sink at the problem right here, and all that it gets us is a quick little run, not even down to the prior swing low, right? But it gives us a point of support here right around 120.82 or thereabout. So. I think this is one that could have that potential for macro shifts in both parent economies that could drive this thing for a few months, maybe even a little bit longer, as you know, the next few months for Europe aren't going to be you know, super positive, at least. We have European uh, QE round one ending in, uh, ending in March. After March, it's effectively a taper because we're getting 60 a month versus 80. Okay, so when QE started, ECB was doing 80 a month. In December, they announced an additional package of 60 a month. So for January, February, March, it was 140. March, the 80 ends. So April on, it's only 60. 
Uh, May we have French elections. I don't think a whole lot is going to happen there. But German elections in September, a little bit more worrisome. And then, of course, in December, QE round two is done. So, you know, once we get out of March, there's not a lot of positive risk factors for the euro. And I think that we still have a lot of longer term short sentiment in the currency. You know, and the story that I always use for this is the reaction that we had before QE even started, right? This is where Mario Draghi announced that QE was going to become a thing. This is when he actually made the announcement in July of 2014. Notice the euro dollar drops like 3,000 pips. European QE actually starts right here. Excuse me, it was a week earlier. It was near the lows. So since European QE has been going on, the euro has stopped dropping, built into a range bound type of formation. And that's been pretty much for the entire duration of QE. And now the QE is ending, I think that we still have a lot of short sentiment that could potentially look to cover up. Now, what confirmed that idea was the price action we saw around China's Black Monday, right? If you remember that, it was a pretty heavy risk off event. Notice how aggressively strong the euro had gotten, so much so that many were saying that the euro would become a safe haven against the US dollar, which is a little bit outlandish of an idea. More, more likely, we had a lot of the short exposure where folks were long dollars, short euros, in anticipation of QE just driving it down to parity as all those banks told us was going to happen. And then when we get things going up in smoke, it's like, okay, forget that carry trade. I'm going to close it back up, get my dollars back, close out of that euro short trade, realize some profits. Uh, so, you know, longer term, I like the idea of looking for that euro strength as the ECB does go towards their own taper. And, you know, combine that with some yen weakness, I think we have a setup that could really be attractive for the next uh, six to nine months. Uh, Greg Groff, uh, okay, so this will be the last question of the day. I saw this one and wanted to make sure I took it because it's a really good one. Uh, well, let me say a bad one, but it comes from a good place. Uh, Greg uh, got burnt by the BOJ trade in yen pairs, but had great price action. They dumped a few billion yen. Uh, total turnaround. Uh, any advice? So first off, I wish I had something better to tell you, you know, a way to prevent that from ever happening again, and I don't. Um, you know, it's, it's, this is a bad analogy, but it's kind of like being a long haul truck driver and, you know, sometimes you just hit ice on the roads and there's not a whole lot that you can do about it, you know, other than trying to learn from it when it happens and then, you know, maybe driving a little bit slower the next time you see, you know, rain at 38 degrees, 37 degrees in Fahrenheit. Sorry, but I don't know the Celsius. Um, I guess it'd be near one or two degrees, right? Zero is freezing. Um, you know, the BOJ especially is, is pretty tricky, pretty tough to work with. But, you know, kind of as a rule, I, I try to get into that driving on icy conditions frame of mind anytime I'm trading in front of a central bank. Uh, especially the big ones, ECB, BOE, BOJ, um, Fed. I mean, any of those guys, I'm going to try to be pretty nimble even before the event to the point where pl trades that I'm placing like on a Monday of a Fed week are in consideration of what might happen on a Wednesday. I, I think that's the best that we can do, you know, other than just avoiding it altogether, which in the analogy of a long-haul truck driver means he's not going to be able to make any income. He's going to have to find a new job, a new way of life, you know. It's it's an, it's unavoidable that central banks central banks will surprise. Um, you know, surprises can hurt you. Surprises can help you, and that's where risk and money management could really come in. You know, to try to kind of help soften that blow. But you know, as far as avoiding it altogether, there's not really much that we can do. Um, you know, one strategy that might help you out or, or one strategy maybe keep in mind is when you're going into a central bank I think or a central bank announcement I think one of the big or one of the most attractive parts of it is the potential for a big move right the potential for the BOJ to announce another round of bond buying or the ECB to announce another round of stimulus and then you know prices to climb for 
four or five percent, right? That's the hope. But think about it like this: if it's going to be one of those big moves, you really need a full, fully leveraged position size to do it. Probably not. You know, if 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 it's going to be a big move, then usually you can go in with a smaller position size, a slightly wider stop to try to give yourself a little more berth on the entry, and so that way you don't necessarily need to take on more of a, a percentage exposure risk on your account. You just do it with a way smaller position, a wider stop, and you know a longer term type of outlook at first. And then if you get it to run in your direction, okay, great. That's when you could use that initial position to start to build into a second one. If it doesn't, then take the stop on the small position and look elsewhere for greener pastures. I mean, that's one of the few ways that I've been able to try to counter that type of stuff. But you know, 2008, my life changed forever when central banks got involved in the mix. And they have become the preeminent driver of most markets on earth. And I hate to say it, but it's unavoidable. All right, so last comment of the day, uh, Shrift had not just the central bank. Good old Trump killed me with his dollar comment. Saw a trade go from 100 plus pips to break even stop. Hey, but that's a break even stop. That's not a loss, right? So you saved that. So, uh, you know, that's, you know, and, and Shrift hits the nail on the head here. It's kind of like I was speaking of a moment ago where, you know, when you get hit, when, when you are in that truck and you get hit, with a patch of ice, you know, the only thing we can really do is hope for the best, try to learn from it, you know, and uh, <laughs> sure says it feels like a loss. Go take some losses and then tell me that, <laughs> right? Uh, or look at your blotter, look at your uh, look at your equity report for this month and look at the red L's and look at the green W's and then, you know, there's no red L next to that break even stop, my friend. Um, but that, my friends, is what I have for today. Um, Thursday, we'll bring it back. We will, uh, we will bring the noise. But uh, thank you so much for your time. I hope you have a fantastic rest of the day. And as always, my friends, happy trading.